Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fifth session in the series about fidelity. We've been working with the ICAN acronym, which stands for Interest, Compassion, Appreciation, and Nurture. In this last session, we'll be focusing on nurture, looking at where a quality of nurturance can be found in our bodies, in our activities, and in life at large. Particularly, we'll be looking at how breathing leads to an energetic aspect in life that provides us with feelings of zest and empowerment. We'll be working as we have been with the respiratory system. So we've looked already at the upper airways, at the lungs, at some of the muscular activity that supports breathing. And today we'll go another step and look at the point of breathing itself. We're aware that when we breathe, we're absorbing oxygen for use by our body and its cells. Of course, the oxygen doesn't work in isolation. It also depends on connecting with food that we eat, for instance, sugar molecules. So when we ingest sugar, our cells can combine it with the oxygen that we breathe. The carbon dioxide we exhale is produced by chemical reactions between the oxygen and the sugars and other substances we eat. A little bit of H2O or water also is produced by these chemical reactions and some of that gets exhaled also. One consequence of all of this is that energy is generated for use by our body and its cells. We can look at this process of breathing and what it produces in a slightly more detailed way. You'll notice that the chemical formula for sugar is one carbon to one water molecule, that is CH2O. This is a proportionate formula. In actual fact, most sugars have six carbons and the equivalent of six water molecules in them. What happens in the body is that the water and carbon of the sugar combine with the oxygen and the atoms are rearranged. And we can kind of see this in process here. And so the atoms of the sugar and oxygen molecules get rearranged into molecules of carbon dioxide and water. And in the process of that chemical transformation, energy is again produced that we use for our activities, including our mental lives, such as producing and watching videos. Now, deep within the body, what we're eating and breathing reaches the cells who have their own way of absorbing oxygen and foodstuffs from the bloodstream and of releasing carbon dioxide and water. In a certain sense, they also breathe, eat, and respire. Of course, cells are a lot more complicated than that initial simple diagram, and they're even a lot more complicated than this somewhat more realistic model. If we look a little bit deeper within the cell, what we'll discover is that the oxygen and sugar are not used equally in all parts of the cell. The energy that comes out is produced by a subunit called the mitochondrion, which you can see in the lower left. We'll return to look at the mitochondrion before long, but I would encourage you to pause the video at this point and allow what we've said so far to sink in. It's important to embody these concepts so that they're not just abstract ideas, but that you begin to feel how the breathing that you're doing minute by minute is combining with the food that you eat several times a day to give you this very experience of feeling alive, feeling the quality of aliveness in your body right now. All the sensations, all the sights and sounds, all the mental activity, everything that you're experiencing is supported by the breathing and the eating and the cellular reactions that follow. 
going back to those reactions, we have the oxygen coming in and the carbon dioxide going out in this process that we call breathing. And again, this produces energy. Now the word energy can be used in a couple of different ways. When biochemists or physicists use the word, they're using it in a technical sense that refers to the capacity to do something useful, some sort of useful work or activity. It can also be associated with something like heating, a, a, a vial of water, for instance. But the energy is measurable in that physical sense of the word, and it's transformable from one form to another, so that if we heat a vial of water, we can produce steam pressure that can be then uh, fed into some kind of turbine to produce mechanical energy and so on. There's this way of transforming energy from one form to another, all of this in physical terms. But we use the word energy in another sense, and that is to describe how energetic we feel uh, on a given day. Some days we feel peppy and have a lot of enthusiasm. Other days we feel more tired and don't really feel like doing so much. So this could be called life energy. It has other names such as chi or prana. There's actually a list of ways uh, that this can be described. But we all know what it feels like to be energized in the body. That quality of feeling energized, that quality of life energy, can be influenced and modified by how we breathe. And I recommend this book called Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art by James Nestor. It describes how powerful the breath can be in helping us modulate our energy on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It happens that breathing does influence the quality of life energy, so-called, uh, very directly. You've probably heard of sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. The parasympathetic response is a relaxation. There are various ways of inviting parasympathetic relaxation, but one of them is simply to exhale slowly. Under the influence of the parasympathetic response, the heart rate tends to slow, the heart beats less forcefully, blood is shunted toward the gut and away from large muscle groups, and the muscle groups themselves tend to relax a little bit. The opposite of the parasympathetic relaxation is sympathetic activation. And this can be invited by a brisk and intentional inhalation. It has a complementary effect. The heart pumps faster and more forcefully, blood moves away from the gut and out to the muscles, and the muscles become more tense in preparation for fighting or fleeing or some sort of response to an environmental challenge. So the two have opposite effects, but they work in concert. There's a complementarity to them. And in healthy life, we modulate one or the other according to circumstance, and we shift from a relatively sympathetic dominant state to a relatively parasympathetic one as we encounter situations that demand more action versus those that allow us to rest and rejuvenate and to center ourselves. It isn't the case that one is better than the other. It can be unhealthy to get locked too heavily into either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic response. So the goal is to learn over time how to fluidly move from one to the other with intention as needed. And of course, the body will do so automatically. And part of what we're learning as we learn all of these techniques that we uh, pursue in mind-body practices is how to get out of the body's way so that it can respond organically as needed and not to you know, some mental content uh, or some uh, buried memory, for instance. So breathing is one way to modulate the relative balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic activities. So we exhale and we inhale, and we can plot the breathing cycle in this way. So there's 
a exhalation on the down slope and then an inhalation on the up slope repeated several times a minute. Interestingly, if we plot the heart rate in a superimposed fashion on top of the breathing pattern, we see that it tends to track uh, in parallel so that during exhalation, the heart rate tends to slow and during inhalation, it tends to rise. This is especially noticeable in people that are healthy and relatively uh, capable of modulating their activity in a fluid way between parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. If we get too locked in one or the other, this variability is uh, often diminished. But what it tells us on its face is how sensitive the parasympathetic and sympathetic balance is to our breathing pattern. So that when we inhale, we're moving into a more sympathetically charged condition. And when we exhale, we're moving into a more parasympathetic state of rejuvenation and uh, stability. So this is why breathing practices are so helpful. Their benefit relates to this nerve called the vagus nerve, which is an important parasympathetic outflow channel of the brain. It exits the brain stem, travels down through the neck, and communicates with the vital organs in the body cavity, including the heart and lungs, digestive tract, and reproductive organs. It's this nerve that plays a central role in the relationship between breathing and parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, balance. So that as we breathe with depth and intention, as this young man is demonstrating, we are actively recruiting the power of the vagus nerve to stabilize us in a relatively parasympathetic state. And yet at the same time, there will be that alternation so that as the young man inhales coming up, he'll be a little more activated. And as he exhales going down, he'll be a little more stable and restful. There will be that slight alternation in sympathetic and parasympathetic balance associated with the breathing. So the vagus nerve gives us this channel through which we can affect our own mental and physical state. And we can encourage more of a parasympathetic stability as opposed to excess sympathetic activation. Now, it happens that some people actually feel fairly depleted and uh, shut down more often than they feel you know, overactivated and agitated. And so for those people, it might be more beneficial to work on the inhalation phase. But either way, breathing practices can help us bring the two systems into balance. And the vagus nerve is part of that process, part of that system. Now, what's happening when the body is breathing on a muscular level? Well, I think we're all aware that the abdominal musculature is important to the breathing process. You know, here we see an anatomical depiction of the famous six-pack abdomen muscles, the rectus abdominis, and they are quite important as we breathe. The muscles, therefore, are one way in which we can begin to influence and connect with this life energy. Often, the feeling of life energy seems to arise from the pelvic structures, the pelvic bone pictured here. In martial arts traditions, such as that young man was demonstrating, the source of life energy is felt to be at the top of the pelvic bone. This is the center of gravity of the body and is referred to as the dantian in uh, Chinese medicine and Chinese martial arts. It's also referred to as the hara in Japanese traditions. In the yoga tradition, a similar connection with energy called prana in that tradition is uh, the kundalini. It is said to arise from the base of the spine like a coiled serpent extending itself up into the body. 
So these traditions have this connection to the region of the abdominal musculature and the region of the pelvis, as indicated. And so a fine meditation can be to focus attention on the breathing movements of the abdominal musculature, which are connected to these traditional ideas of the Dantian and Kundalini energies. If those Eastern terms don't resonate for you, you could simply visualize a river of light or stars rising from the pelvic region, rising from the center of the body, and filling the whole organism with energy. This kind of visualization is a healthy practice and one that I uh, would encourage you to try out by pausing the video momentarily and just taking a few breaths and visualizing or directly feeling a sense of energetic movement rising from the lower body and spreading outward. So here we are back at the cell, and I mentioned the mitochondrion earlier. It's this structure down in the lower left that actually uses the oxygen and sugar molecules and that generates the carbon dioxide and water. Looked at in a little more detail, we can see here how it's got two layers, an outer layer and an inner layer, and they function together in a complex way to produce usable energy in the body. In essence, the chemical reaction that's going on here is similar to the chemical reaction of a campfire. So whereas the mitochondrion is combining sugar with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, a campfire combines wood, which is cellulose, which is made up of sugar, with oxygen, and again produces carbon dioxide and water. In both cases, we have a kind of burning process, a chemical reaction that releases energy. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, simple fires like this were worked with to find ways to extract mechanical energy, or you know what we call work, from fire. It's clear that fires produce lots of heat. This has been known for thousands of years, but they had never been particularly useful for doing actual work. For that, we needed human labor or uh, domestic animal labor, but you couldn't use fire to, for instance, build a pyramid. That just wasn't possible until the Industrial Revolution. So early on, the idea of getting useful energy out of heat was not viable. The heat would disperse into the environment and nothing useful would come of it. So the question became, how, how can this problem be solved? And the early steam engines were the first uh, solutions. So the idea of a simple steam engine is that a fire is burnt under a closed container with water in it. Of course, the water heats up and it boils and the steam builds up a pressure inside the closed container. That pressure is released in a controlled fashion and used to perform some kind of mechanical motion. One possibility is a turbine wheel, such as shown here. So the steam blasting out of the nozzle from the pressure chamber spins the turbine wheel, and that can be connected to a locomotive, uh, for instance, although the early trains used a piston system, not a turbine system. Turbines, though, are very frequently used to connect with generators, as shown here, which produce electricity, which, of course, is a useful form of energy. So we've successfully converted the heat of the fire into a usable form of energy through this process. Well, the mitochondrion is doing something analogous. If we look at a little region uh, on the internal membrane of the mitochondrion and enlarge it, we can see how as the mitochondrion takes in sugar and oxygen and releases carbon dioxide and water, it builds up a kind of pressure 
between the inner and outer membrane. This is an osmotic pressure due to the accumulation of protons in that space. The details are technical. We don't need to you know, overly uh, obsess about them. But in effect, this leads to a kind of pressurized box or container that can be employed to generate something useful for the organism. So speaking very loosely, that pressure causes a turning that's connected to something like a generator that produces useful energy. In this case, that useful energy is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's the nearly universal currency uh, that allows cells to perform all of the functions that they perform. They employ ATP as an energy source. And so the mitochondrion converts the sugars that we eat and the oxygen that we breathe into a usable ATP by virtue of a system somewhat analogous to that of a steam engine. So we can picture this system a little bit as shown. Here's a more realistic portrayal of it. The spinning is occurring in the lower part of the frame. The red molecule coming out of the top with the yellow arrow pointing to it is the ATP that's being generated. There are a very large number of these little molecular energy generators in each mitochondrion, and there are hundreds of thousands of mitochondria in each cell of the body and trillions of cells uh, in the body. So the number of these little energy generators is very high. Uh, I wrote here 4 million galaxies worth of stars. That's probably an underestimate, but we can consider uh, that there's at least that many energy generators in the body. So that picture that I offered as a visualization earlier of a stream of stars or light rising out from the center of the body into the rest of the organism was chosen with this in mind. So this quality of nurture can be looked at in several ways uh, at this stage. We can think of how we nurture the body by breathing and eating. We can think of how we nurture its health by practicing breathing movements that help to balance parasympathetic and sympathetic energies. And we can think of how every cell in the body is nurturing our very existence through its many mitochondria and the quite remarkable molecular activity that leads from oxygen and sugar to the energy that we call conscious life. To sit and contemplate and to even feel this energetic quality in the body and feel it permeating the tissues can be a very nurturing process. This concludes this episode of Mindful Biology. It also concludes our Fidelity series. I hope you've found it beneficial please check out the other offerings on my YouTube channel or on my website, mindfulbiology.org. Thank you for watching.